All right, wonderful, we're live, so let's get started. Hi everyone, my name is Liz Eggleston and I run Course Report, which is a resource for students who are choosing a boot camp. If you haven't used Course Report before, this is my one shameless plug of the whole video. We've got thousands of alumni reviews, Q and A's with students, instructors, everything you need to choose the right boot camp for you. And today I'm joined by two awesome people. I'm joined by Nathan Thompson, who is a graduate of Metis. And Metis is, as you know, a data science boot camp that's in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Seattle. Hi, Nathan. Um, and Nathan graduated from Metis in San Francisco in 2016, but since then has moved to Seattle. And that is where our second guest, Mary Beth Redmond, has been working as a career coach for years. So hi, Mary Beth. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. So as Nathan's career has grown and Mary Beth has been working with new data scientists in Seattle, I think they've learned a lot about the job market, the application process, and probably so much more about data science in Seattle. So I wanted to have them share that wisdom with course reporters. So we're going to focus on Seattle, but I think a lot of this advice will actually be very helpful to future data scientists, regardless of where you're living and learning. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, Mary Beth, do you want to start? You've been in the career coaching world for a while, uh, but what do you do at Metis? Yeah, um, thanks, Liz. I do, obviously, I am the full-time, you know, Monday through Friday on-site career coach. So I work with the students during the cohort. So that means one-on-one -on -one meetings to understand their goals for after the boot camp. Also delivering career workshops such as resume, LinkedIn, networking, how to search for a job in data science, how to negotiate an offer, all those things. Um, I do that throughout the camp. And then I also um, bring in guest speakers who are data science leaders in the local community for them to come in and meet and speak with our students to learn about what different companies are doing in the data science landscape here in Seattle. So the guest speakers are always a lot of fun. And then my big penultimate event is um, inviting in um, employers, potential employers, to meet our grads for our career day. And it's a chance for our grads to get up and present their passion project and then instantly be able to meet and network and mingle with employers. So a lot of it is one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, networking, um, workshops, career day, and then really I work with the students almost more after they graduate, right? Because oh. I am their coach until they land. So that all just continues, right? And we have a strong alumni channel. So and that's basically and what I do. Yeah. 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 And Nathan, you went to medicine, uh, San Francisco and Mary Beth is in Seattle, obviously. So you didn't work exactly with, you know, one-on-one -on -one with her, but you would have worked with another uh, career coach in San Francisco, I'm assuming. Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, Metis wasn't in Seattle um, way back then, so uh, it was in San Francisco. And what were you up to before you went to Metis? Um, I just finished grad school, and I had done quantitative work in grad school and was trying to get a job doing something, getting experience with that. and was unsuccessful uh, throughout that fall in finding anything where I could uh, sort of grow and work with data. And then I found Metis, so I ended up going there. So you were doing quantitative work. What, what like, specifically, like, what were your, I guess, jobs before you went to, before you were a data scientist? Uh, it was, well, I was in school pretty much up until right, I started right. working as a data scientist. So it was mostly research right. assistant work um, for professors, a lot of academic stuff. I was in a public, I did a public policy master's and the quantitative work that I did was mostly around income inequality and how to calculate oh. it at really local geographies. Um, yeah, so it was that kind of, it was, cool. it was very sort of academic-y policy-based stuff. And did you research or like consider other data science boot camps? I know you're a 
doing this in 2016. So the landscape was a bit uh, a bit smaller, but like, why did you end up choosing Metis? What stood out uh, as you were doing your research? Um, yeah, I definitely shopped around, um, tried to just do my due diligence on the programs. Um, Metis, I talked to alums and heard good things. Um, I talked to the people at Metis and got good answers. Um, and then there was, it seemed like there was, compared to some of the other boot camps, there was maybe a lower bar for entry and then you do a lot more pre-work and they kind of train you up. So it was something that I could start right away, whereas instead of having to like go back and study for a couple months and then apply. Um, right. Yeah, and it was cheaper. Nice. Yeah, there are a lot of, I guess, that are like, PhD you have experience like with Python or R already, but that's nice that you, Kind of thought. Yeah, other like, boot camps yeah. run the gamut from like, you know, we'll take you if this is your first time using a computer to like, you have to have a PhD and we focus on that. So medicine was like the perfect uh, sort of, I can start this now and, and get out there. And Okay, so you attended medicine in San Francisco, then you moved to Seattle after graduating. And what kind of like motivated that move? Did you live in Seattle before and want to get back there? Um, I, I lived in work. Portland at the time, and I was trying to find a job in Portland, but it's a much smaller scene, um, especially okay. then, especially just for entry level um, stuff. So I would go and there'd be 15 jobs I could apply for in Portland and like 100 in Seattle or San Francisco. So it just, I just ended up, this is where, this is where I got, I got I moved up here because I got hired up here. And so, Mary Beth, could you maybe just like describe the job market for Seattle um, for data science in Seattle? Like, what types of companies are hiring? Is the job market like saturated with uh, with applicants these days? What uh, are there are there a ton more jobs in Seattle than other cities, or what do you see? Yeah, great question. Um, like Nathan said, we are a larger city than Portland, so we're sometimes you'll hear Seattle being referred to as um, Silicon Valley North. So we do have a, that tech presence here. So obviously we have, you know, Microsoft, um, you know, Google, Facebook. We've got, you know, Amazon, obviously. So we have some really big players who are hiring data scientists and data analysts. But we also have, because of that sort of tech um, startup, you know, we have a lot of startups that come to Seattle too to try to, um, well, it's a great landscape for them. So we have a lot of mid-sized companies that a lot, many of our grads have landed at, um, Outreach, Element, Element Data. We have you know, a number of startups too. So I would consider the Seattle market pretty darn hot. Um, lots of jobs out there, but competitive, right? Um, so, you know, there are, I, it's not saturated. I do find a number of um, employers wanting the senior uh, data scientists because often what we find is maybe they're building data science within their company. So they want someone with more experience to come in and help build the team. So some of our grads run into that, like, hey, we're interested, we love your skills, but we want someone to come in with a lot of experience out of the gates. So we do run into that, but we've also had a lot of success with companies that are more open to either, you know, whether that's an internship or even we've had a lot of success with contract to hire opportunities. So those companies that are like, hey, we're interested, we want your people, but we want someone with more exper experience, we've been able to um, work with them, build really good hiring partnerships, have success and build off that success. So it's a hot market. It's competitive though. You have to differentiate differentiate yourself because you're one of many. So, but yeah. yeah, Nathan, from your perspective as a job applicant, is that kind of like the job market that you've seen over the last three years? And I'm curious because, of course, uh, you know, we're looking for junior versus senior uh, data scientists. But I'm also curious how, like, the reactions that you got, you know, when you were first starting your job search in 2016 as a new boot camp graduate versus now, um, how has that kind of evolved or have you seen a, an evolution in like people's opinions there? Um, as far, I don't know if it's, it's hard to say if like the people are changing 
or if I'm just changing, you know, the first, the hardest job to get in tech is your first job. Um, and after that, I haven't, I mean, I, I've had three jobs since mm -hmm. then, and I haven't a, a really like formally applied for any of them. Oh, really? So, yeah, like, yeah, I just got hired or, you know, offered or I never had to like, I haven't had to fill out an application <laughs> since then. Have you um, but I will, I will say, I will echo that like, even just now being kind of on the other side and being the interviewer instead of the interviewee, the entry level market, yeah, it's, it's very crowded. Everybody wants to hire data scientists. So mm -hmm. like the jobs are there and the need is definitely there. It's not going anywhere. But at the same time, like that one, just like trying to get into it is definitely a challenge for sure. So you haven't applied for any jobs in the last three years? Uh, no, well, I guess technically my HDL was uh, an applicant. Yeah, that was an application. So the, the first job that I moved up here for um, at HDL I applied for, but since then, no. Okay, so how do you like, how do you do that? I guess that, it, you know, having like a warm lead or like being reached out to is one way to find a job, but um, how have you like found success in that? Are you just like an amazing networker? <laughs> like, are you, how do you find those jobs? Um, it's been people that I've worked with that have changed that keep wanting to work with you. And they'll, so they'll reach out and they'll make the referral. Um, that's kind of the warm, the warm handshake there. Uh, and then, or just being acquired was one of them. I was at a startup that DocuSign bought and it's like, oh, so now I work for DocuSign. Um, that's, that's another avenue that, it, that works. <laughs> that's very cool. Um, Mary Beth, can you kind of weigh in here from like a more macro perspective? Like what types of, uh, channels or ways do Metascrads get their foot in the door at companies? Like, what do you think is the most successful approach? People just like fire their resume out to as many people as they can, to be networking, like what, how do you land those interviews? Yeah, um, you know, for that first job, like Nathan said, that's the hardest, right? So the first job is still like a lot of networking and trying to get those referrals. So meeting people, making connections, following up with people so that you can get a warmer lead. Um, but then at the same time, it does take too applying because sometimes in writing a good cover letter, a cover letter that can maybe stand out. Um, and that's a higher volume if you're cold applying, right? So those numbers have to be pretty high because they've shown that you have about a 10% chance of getting a job that way if you're only cold applying. But that first job, you know, you kind of have to try a few things. Um, you have to network, you have to join meetups, you have to and leverage your alumni. Like our alumni channel is really strong. That's where I see a lot of our grads, um, especially when they're really just starting that job search, reaching out and finding out where, you know, and with my help and through our Slack channel, where are our alumni and talking with them, having coffee with them, just learning about what they're doing, that tends to really, whether that turns into a referral or not, it helps them to you know, really set themselves up, whether it's refining their resume better for that job or writing that cover letter. So, so much of it is, you know, Seattle's a big city, but kind of a small town. And I think that's probably true of, of all big cities. So a lot of it is to like, making that human connection, getting to know people and having that really open up more doors for you too. And yeah, I, second you, that, yeah, I second that alumni bit. That's how I got the first job that I moved up here for was responding to stuff in the Metis alumni select channel. Oh, and the, and the, even before I was at a full-time, the full-time job up here, I had got contract work through the same, same channel. Nice. For them, have you like a, a alumni tour having been in the file? Sorry, so, could you repeat that? Well, do you feel heard now and like you have you been mentoring other Metis graduates as they graduate in the last couple of years? Um, yeah, I don't hear from so many people once they've graduated. Uh, I think they're kind of, it seems like, you know, they're being well taken care of and <laughs> have enough to do on their plates. I talk to a lot more people um, that are considering the boot camp or okay. are in it for ahead of time. Yeah. 
Um, wow. But I do try, I keep in contact with the people from my cohort, for sure. Yeah, cool. Okay, so that first job in Seattle, um, it was at uh, Yale, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you can like rewind and think about that one, since that was really like the one that you applied for, you found it through an alumni connection. Um, but mm -hmm. like, what was that job interview like? And like, what do you think actually got you the job, um, got you your first job, you know, in data science? It was a, we did a technical phone screen and then an on-site uh, afterwards. I, cause I was living in Portland and I had to go up to Seattle. I was actually like 45 minutes late to the interview or something like that. And I still got the job, but it was programming questions, um, talked to different, they would just, you know, it was a loop. They would bring different people in, uh, try to cover a different area. Um, as far as what got me the job, I think this is just guessing, but, um, I got the questions right eventually, but not giving up on them. I think they're, from what I, when I talked to the people that were interviewing, they got a lot of people that would get halfway through the question and like be hitting the challenging parts and then kind of give up. So unless they're, unless they've stopped you from like working on it on the whiteboard, I'd just keep going until, you know, until somebody calls it quits. That's sure. really good advice. Um, were there, do you like remember, this might be way too long ago, but do you remember like any questions that stumped you or have you asked, have you found that there are like questions that really stump people as you have now been interviewing? Uh, I mean that stumping somebody with a question, unless it's like, mm, this is really easy, doesn't tell you much as an interviewer. Okay. If you're not trying to get, it's just, you know, or like, okay, they don't know that. Um, I think there was one that was what's the, just name, what's a, the time complexity for a machine learning algorithm, like pick one and name it. Uh, I'm, I think I got it wrong for whatever <laughs> I think, but that's one thing that's, um, it's like you might know a lot about, you can learn a lot about machine learning without like coming at it from that computation angle. Um, so that's sort of just like, I think they were just plumbing the, like the software engineering depth of how, how much I knew. Got it. Okay, this is for Mary Beth or Nathan, um, please mm -hmm. wait. Okay, so you find out that you have an interview in like 24 hours. You have no time, uh, basically, but how do you spend that time preparing for an interview? What do you think is most important? Your portfolio, prepping for like whiteboard uh, questions, Kaggle competitions, like how would you spend 24 hours preparing for an interview? Good question. I'll, I'll chime in, Nathan, and then you help with the other stuff. So what I've been hearing a lot from our alums and one that just landed a job the other day was he was just so, um, he felt like he was able to get that position because of his portfolio, because of his, like at Metas, you walk out with like five projects, four of them you've done completely yourself, right? Design, everything. In, and being able to really, so to prepare, a lot of times they'll, folks will make sure that they're, you know, able to speak about their projects that they designed and developed here at Metis, um, be able to talk about why they chose that model, um, what they would do different, how would they improve upon it. So that's a big area that I make sure people can speak to in an interview. Obviously, researching the heck out of the company and making sure that you know as much as you can sort of beyond um, that job description and just, you know, looking at their website, like making sure that you understand their space as much as possible and maybe even trying to think through what problems around data might they be struggling with or trying to um, factor in. Obviously talking to anybody you might know that works there or anybody that knows somebody that's worked there before because that might give you some insight. The job description usually kind of gives you an idea of what they might be focusing on from a technical standpoint. But sometimes it's different, like if it's your very first phone call with a company, it might be HR, right? And it might be more like, so why are you interested in this position and why data science? Or you know, what are you looking for for salary? So sometimes it's really uh, depends on kind of where you are in the process. But a lot of it I think does um, really revolve around their portfolio and their projects, because that's the proof 
for me. I used to be a recruiter. I was a recruiter in Seattle for 20 years before I moved to coaching. And you can't just tell me that you can do something. You have to show me that you can do it. And that, I think, gives them the show me part. Oh. That's great advice. Um, yeah. Nathan, anything, anything you've noticed? Anything I think Mary Beth covered it, just about covered it all. Definitely like research a lot about the company, know how they make money and how you're going to make them more money. <laughs> uh, um, maybe do, I, if you think there's, if it's a, like I said, if you, it's gonna be a technical screen, like I would do coding work, stand at a whiteboard. It's not really a natural thing that I've, that you practice. Um, so if you have the time, like at least just go through the motions so you're comfortable. Um, but yeah, I think researching the, the company would probably be top of my list. Cool. Yeah. One thing I'll add to that, if that's okay, Liz, is we often have this come up where can, or one of our alums gets an interview and they're like, oh my gosh, I have an interview and help. So um, we, we have a system in place where they can come in also and do um, mock technical interviews with our instructors and I'll do the mock non-technical, like tell me about yourself and things like that. So often, if there's time, we can get them in quickly and even have them do some practicing right with us, right on the whiteboard. And that helps. Yeah. That's a great resource. Yeah. Um, OK, so Nathan, your career, like just resume wise, has certainly grown since you graduated from, from Metis. Um, I think you've had, so you did a contract job and then started at HCL, mm -hmm. then moved to APRI. Right. Sorry, you cut for a and then and then what was the next company that you moved to? Uh, it, it was a startup called Apuri. Cool. And then that yeah. got acquired by DocuSign. Correct. Quite. Yeah, so a, now I work for DocuSign. Years. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> so, like aside from just kind of you know resume changes, like have you been you know have you. Do you feel like you're taking on more responsibility as you as you kind of move jobs? Have you gotten like actual promotions, or do you just like uh, how do you feel like you've changed and kind of grown as a data scientist over the past two to three years? Yeah, I've become much doing much more of software engine of the engineering side. Um, in fact, I. I don't know if I, anything I've done in the last year even would be could be called data science. It's a lot more data engineering, um, and do a lot of that like systems, fundamental systems focus. Um, I think that's probably been the biggest you know change or trajectory. Um, but just going from, especially working at a startup, you end up having to having you you can't like sit in and just do data science work. So it forced me to do a lot more software engineering and developer stuff. So I think that's been the biggest change. Um, it's kind of hard to say if I got promoted or not, like across these different uh, job to job, but it's definitely, yeah. But do you feel like you've been like learning and growing? I guess like, do you feel like a better data scientist now than you were? Oh yeah, yeah. I know, you know, end up just knowing so much more about software and computers and not that you like, you. Of course, you're like you're just cramming and learning at uh, at a boot camp at Metis at some mm -hmm. point, but you you end up learning so much more on the job just by like being in that situation, forced to actually mm -hmm. uh, produce the work for years. Yeah. Okay, I ask people that graduate from data science boot camps this all the time and always get different answers, so I'm just curious. But at what point in the last, you know, three years since you like decided to enroll at Metis, graduated from Metis, got your first job as a data scientist, now like have your, you know, second or third job as a data scientist, like when did you, was there a point where you felt like you were could truly call yourself a data scientist? Like you no longer said that <laughs> research assistant, I'm now a data scientist. Uh, yeah, I think it was when I got the first uh, like business card from my job that said data scientist on it. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, I'm a big boy now. <laughs> so I think that was the, that was probably the moment. Um, Cause you know, you start in Metis, you're doing data science work. I um, mean, you're trying to present yourself as a data scientist and then the the line between that and sort of and research that 
deals with a lot of data, it gets gets blurry. Mm. So you sort of there's there aren't that many like tipping points as for oh now I'm a data scientist, but. I think getting the cards was <laughs> that felt real. Um, well, Mary Beth, as uh, like Nathan has kind of pointed out, like there are different jobs within the you know world of data science, more like data engineering jobs and more software engineering jobs, um, yeah. and probably way more. And obviously, there are totally you know a bunch of different companies that are that hire for data science jobs. But how do you advise students or boot camp grads specifically to? find a job that they actually love? Like, is there kind of a balance between just kind of getting paid to do a data science job and like finding a job that you're gonna love forever? And how does a bootcamp grad figure that out? Great question. That's, yeah, that's where I definitely um, sort of, um, you know, earn my keep is trying to figure out that balance. <laughs> I think for that first job, especially, I mean, obviously, if you want to find the job that you love, you have to figure out what does that mean to you? What's your criteria, right? What is the work like? As much as possible, really kind of peel the onion with yourself on what is it that is that job that you love. So identify it as much as possible. Once again, that first job, sometimes you just have to get it, right? And so it may not be necessarily the one that you love, but if it can point you in the direction and get you on that path, um, obviously, sometimes we actually do land that first job that we really love, and then things happen, companies get acquired, bosses leave, whatever, reorgs happen, and so sometimes it can actually turn out to be a job that isn't maybe necessarily a job you love. Um, so I, what I advise a lot is find, identify our criteria, find the job that aligns with your criteria the best. It may not be perfect but the best that it can be. And then go into there and add value, stretch and grow and learn, own your career as much as possible, communicate with your manager too on your goals, what you want, and drive that. Raise your hand a lot, right, for projects and volunteer for things with, if you can, within your company to stretch yourself. Sometimes your dream job is the one that you have that develops into more. Right. Like Nathan was saying in his roles, he's had to wear all kinds of hats. He's had to he's been exposed to things that he probably didn't even think he would get exposed to. And sometimes that opens us up in, within our jobs to realize, oh, I love this job or things shift. And you realize, hey, I, I learned a lot. I, I provided value. I, I stretched myself. Now it's time to move to that other job that is a better balance or a better fit. So. Good question. Um, always somebody, something that I'm working on with my folks all the time is what, how can we balance that the best for you? And then how do you continue to balance that moving forward? Yeah. Is there, Nathan, is there anything that you wanted to add from your kind of like perspective changing jobs? Like how no, did I, you decide I, that you wanted to go toward, go in the direction of data engineering? Um, I liked the when I was ended up just doing the work um, and getting assigned it, and I liked it. It's also uh, it's it is kind of like a wax on wax off training for doing data science at scale. You learn a lot about just movement of data and correctness and how the systems are working. I also think that data science requires good data engineering, so somebody's doing it. Um, whether you have a data engineering team or data scientists that are spending their time doing data engineering, um, mm -hmm. that's been kind of a prerequisite. So I've been in uh, situations both at a PURI and now at DocuSign where they're a lot earlier on that journey of building out the infrastructure to enable data science, effective data science at scale. So that's also just been like the work that's presented mm -hmm. um, to me for sure. Um, and I would I would second everything that Mary Beth said about just like, don't you get it? Don't be as picky with the first job. Just like get in the game, get mm -hmm. the experience. You'll have a. It'll be a lot easier and a lot to get the. If it's if it does turn out to be you know not what you want to switch, um, you can't like jump from job to job to job all the time. Sorry. But it's definitely. I, I you know I, my first job full first full time job I was at for eight or nine months um, before I left. So like it's it's certainly possible. 
Do you all think that like the content of the job or like what the company does matters? I, th I think it can. I mean, I think it really depends. Um, I think for a lot of people, it matters a lot. Right. I find a lot of our um, alums and folks that I talk to in data science want to be trying to do is something good with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, as much as possible. So and for those folks, you know, going to maybe a, a Bill and Melinda Gates or Path or something or whatever is really up their alley. I think for a, like, you know, getting back to that first job. I think the um, industry is important to some people, but I think a lot of people are like, hey, you know what? I just really want to get that first job and get that experience and figure out what industry I want to be in if there is a certain industry right, in mind. Yeah, I think I definitely agree with that. Not, not just industry, but also city. Like I, city, yeah. I think you have to, if you're, if you're willing and able to move um, like I was just to get started, I think that, mm -hmm. That should be on the table. I think maybe not even starting from like industries that you like really want to work on. Like that's a good starting place, but also just like pick the ones that you couldn't ever work in and then like apply to just about everything else. Um, I think it's I think it's good to be broad as broad as you can for that first job. Well, speaking of city, um, do you you know you were in Portland before you went to San Francisco, now you're in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Seattle has proven to be a good city to kind of help you develop your career as a data scientist? Like, how do you like working in Seattle, I guess? Um, I like it a lot. It's been it's been great. There's like there's a big tech industry here. So there's a lot of the community is still there. You know, it's not the crazy hub that San Francisco is, but, you know, kind of nowhere is. And it's a lot it's just more livable than San Francisco in terms of cost and, mm -hmm. and lifestyle. So it's been great so far for sure. Do y'all have any like favorite meetups, groups, things in Seattle that you would recommend? And Nathan, you said that you talked to a lot of uh, people who are choosing a data science bootcamp or like looking at Metis, like do you recommend mm -hmm. that they start with a specific meetup or group in, in Seattle? Uh, I like um, the Puppy, which is the local Python group. It's, it's pretty active. It's strong. And they have like a machine learning advanced topics group that I attend. That's good for just continuing education. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like getting started, I mean, yeah, there's you kind of get to just start attending meetups and learn how to learn how to choose the good ones um, on your own. Yeah. I, I would agree with that 100%. Um, some of the ones that, like, uh, there's one called New Tech Northwest, which always brings in speakers from different companies and also hosts really, like, relevant and good career fairs or job fairs because they're not always the most fun thing to go to, but they're actually really good. Um, another one that I, like, we have our, the Meta Seattle Data Science Meetup. We host a lot of the puppy groups and whatnot ourselves. And then I would say another one is the Seattle Women in Data Science. You don't have to be a woman to attend. They just promote women speakers. I've been attending that myself and I'm finding it really active and some outstanding um, speakers and neat connections and networking. Um, Puppy is definitely one. And then GeekWire, I don't know, um, Nathan, if you are familiar with them or that group GeekWire, they have, it's sort of the broader tech uh, scene you know they they have events and whatnot that they host here in seattle um and often have a really good job board too called geek jobs so yeah we have a lot going on here in seattle as far as meetups and groups that are relevant cool yeah um nathan is docusign based in seattle uh they're headquartered in san francisco okay. they were founded up here and it's still the largest office so okay. yeah most yeah, of the engineering is still up here got it are is that like as you kind of like become a more senior data scientist over the years like is it what have you kind of like done to become to to grow like you mentioned going doing you know uh going to that meetup and like mm -hmm. education there like once you get your first job in data science like is it just doing stuff on the job, getting a mentor at work, going to a ton of 
you know, kind of more courses and things like that? How do you get better? Yeah, that's a big part of it. I mean, if you can do, there's definitely like I should be doing, uh, there are holes in my knowledge that I can fill and go do more courses and whatnot. It is once you have a full time job, it is very hard to like go home from programming all day and like do a, do more side projects and take classes. So I think a lot, most of the development has been uh, the, the development that I'm getting paid to do. <laughs> but uh, that, it they've all, DocuSign's also sent me to uh, conferences and I've mm. been able to uh, sort of explore that scene and get into it and stay in touch with data science even if I'm not doing data science work day to day. Mm -hmm. But that's another good one if you can if your company uh, is supportive of it. I think there's there's good some good conferences out there too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, all right, wonderful. Well, I think that that is um, all that I have. Is there any other career advice that you have for folks that are just about to get started in data science or just about to do a boot camp like Metis? Um, anything like Seattle specific or just kind of general <laughs> advice that you give people? I think just to piggyback a little bit what Nathan was just saying too, um, mm -hmm. I, n I noticed too that when folks are either getting started or um, just kind of embarking on this as a recruiter, I often put my old recruiter hat on and if they're blogging and they're writing articles and maybe even speaking, at, if they can, I mean, I guess that might be hard if you're just getting started to actually speak at a conference, but attending those conferences and blogging and writing articles is something that really gives um, a, an alumni and, a, and you know a little bit more of a uh, leg up when they're trying to break in. So be get the word out and not be afraid to share your knowledge. Amazing, Nathan. Anything we didn't cover that you want to make sure people know? Um, I don't think so. I think we get we get most of it. Covered a lot. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much to Nathan and Mary Beth for joining. I think your advice has been um, really cool and such a great, like, mm. two different perspectives on the same topic. So um, I love that. And uh, if you tuned in and watched this video, uh, we will post, we'll link to the full blog post in the description below. We'll do a full transcription of, of this webinar. And uh, there are so many great takeaways and good points in here. We'll include them all on course report. Uh, so we'll see you at the next one. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.